All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the show today. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, just want to do a little tech check, make sure that the video looks good, the sound is good. If you can see me, if you can hear me, if you can just put it in the chat for me, just so that I know that, that all my tech settings are correct, I would appreciate it so, so much. Um, welcome to the show. Uh, should be should be a good one today. Basically, have a bunch of questions that I'll go through. Uh, uh, I got a whole bunch of questions through email and just through different channels. And uh, obviously, if you have questions, I'm here to answer your questions. Uh, I'm not going to have a guest on today. Instead, just figure we can kind of do a market overview, show you a few things that are going on in the green economy, and then really can jump to the Q and A because I think that's where people do get the most value out of this. Uh, is to get all of their wonderful questions answered. Uh, before I jump into it, a couple small things to share, uh, uh, kind of some cool things going on. So uh, I got a huge number of congrats messages. It was so sweet. I got my CFP and I now have it in the, uh, I got it in the mail, so I have my certificate. Uh, I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to see that well, but hopefully you can see it there. And then the other cool thing that came in the mail is uh, my RIA uh, Leadership Award. So I have this beautiful award, uh, which is kind of awesome, uh, really nice design, and it's so cool. I'm starting to like build a little trophy shelf or something. I'll have to put something up in the background, uh, uh, figure out how the heck do I get uh, a certificate framed during COVID. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to do that one, but uh, can figure, figure that out. If you have any good ideas for me for how to get a frame that I can throw that up on the wall, I uh, would really appreciate it. Um, cool. Okay, great. Uh, John, thanks for letting me know. All good. I appreciate that. It's always a little nerve wracking to know. Hopefully they can hear me and see me. Um, can't always verify that for sure. So uh, in terms of the market outlook, uh, we can just take a look at things. The markets are like blissfully flat today. You can see the Toronto stock market up, you know, 0.01%. The S&P 500 uh, down 0.12%. This is just remarkably flat, which to me, you know, I'll take that right now. Things have been a little hectic over the last few months. Uh, when I look at the All Country World Index, uh, this is again my benchmark for like the global stock market. We can look at this just over the last, uh, hold on, um, why don't I say three months? Let's go six months because that kind of shows uh, the COVID crash and then how things have continued to climb back up. So if we look at the last couple weeks, you know, it has been a, a bit of an upward trend in the market, just a tiny little bit, you know, really since, since the start of July here. Uh, this would have been a couple weeks ago when I did my last show. So, you know, kind of flat and then it has come up just a little bit. You know, the big thing I'm noticing is sort of how flat things are, that markets really aren't responding to news, that there was a time where, you know, if there was news about a vaccine or a treatment for COVID, that things would really, you know, jump up. And then if it turned out that maybe that research wasn't as, as comprehensive as we thought, then, you know, markets would really respond down. Now, you know, things are kind of calm in terms of, of reaction to this type of news that I think that markets have priced in that there is going to be some sort of return to normalcy. I don't know. We don't know what that looks like. And I think there are a lot of questions, especially around schools reopening in September and how important it is to get that right. Uh, but it seems to me that, you know, markets have recovered to some degree. Uh, you know, if I go back uh, about a year and we can look at the chart over the last year, you can see that the markets today are back where they were probably about December of 2019. So, you know, we thought things were a little overpriced then and, you know, certainly we're back up there now. So the market definitely isn't cheap um, uh, and it really has been dominated by the biggest company. So Apple is the biggest company in the world. Um, I'll, I'll keep that one light blue. You can see over the last year how much that's dominated. Uh, Alphabet, which is Google. Um, here it is. I can show you this one. Keep that one purple. Uh, you know, and then even things like Amazon. I know I'm doing all of the A letters today, but those are the ones that have just done so well. Uh, Microsoft uh, should be on this list as well. And you can just see that, you know, really it is being driven by the largest companies in the stock market. So that really is what's driving performance right now. I think investors are seeing a lot of security. 
um, in, uh, uh, in the biggest companies. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't show you what's been happening with Tesla, um, T-S-L-A. Here we go. Tesla has just been on a tear. Uh, you can see here, you know, these are all the other ones I didn't do as a comparison, but here's Tesla up 500% over the last year. It's just been remarkable to watch it and just, you know, from the crash and just how much it surged. Tesla is on a tear. Um, you know, a lot of this is going to be driven by retail investors. And, you know, a lot of people are wondering how the heck can Tesla be valued this highly? But it is. So to me, this shows you just the appetite that we're seeing, not only for large companies, but also for uh, green companies. And I think that Tesla being the biggest green company, you know, has certainly benefited from both those trends. A um, couple of other things I'll show you here is I like to keep an eye on the VIX. So the VIX, we can look at, I'll just get rid of everything else, hold on. Uh, so this is the volatility index, which is the measure of, of volatility. You can see over the last year, obviously things surged, you know, during the crisis and then have started to come back down. So, you know, today with markets being as flat as they are, likely will continue to bring down this volatility index. Again, I'd like to see it below 20, so we're not quite there yet but you know, certainly we're on our way. Uh, from there, you know, the only other thing that I do like to show is you know, the B&M Bloomberg uh, oil prices. Uh, I find it's nice just to keep an eye on the oil price. This impacts so much for Canada, but also tends to be a signal of you know, not only uh, uh, the fossil fuel economy and sort of where things are going there, but also in terms of the broader economic recovery, that if things really were gonna get back to normal, we would start to see the price of oil go up. So you can see here, oil, you know, 42 bucks a barrel. It is recovering ever so slightly uh, 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 over the last couple weeks, but just barely. This tells me that there isn't a huge amount of confidence, that things aren't fully sort of back to normal, right? Uh, um, and that if we look at the Western Canadian Select, which is the Alberta uh, oil, uh, you've got 32 bucks a barrel, which is fine. I think that, you know, this is gonna stem the tide of a lot when, when prices were so low, five bucks a barrel, eight bucks a barrel, we were talking a lot about bankruptcies. At 32 bucks a barrel, they're not gonna make a huge amount of money, but you know, I don't think as many firms are, are gonna be going under, that they are trying to sort of wait this out. So, you know, again, signals that the economy is starting to come back, although obviously a lot of headwinds, specifically with COVID cases in the US, you know, really the US needs to get it under control and especially with school starting in September, you know, definitely a lot of concerns there that there could be another shutdown. Uh, from there, the biggest sort of big news that's been in the world, the big two things that I'm following my, uh, uh, keeping my eye on are these green stimulus projects. Uh, so you can see here the European Union stepped up. This was just a couple days ago um, and they, they've got this $572 billion plan so this is kind of this idea of a green new deal or green stimulus, but these are going to be more subsidies and government programs specifically targeted on the green economy, which is fantastic for us sustainable investors that really, you know, part of the thesis here is that governments are going to be moving in this direction, that there is going to be more support uh, for these uh, green and green infrastructure projects and, uh, you know, to see this announcement come up this is absolutely historic you know half a trillion dollars uh which is just phenomenal um so really excited to see that this has been approved in the eu and then in the us uh there was a huge announcement from joe biden uh, of a two trillion dollar climate plan uh this is over the next i think four years this would be over his first term so about half a trillion per year but, you know, really, obviously, with the U.S. just lagging behind, you know, Trump just has absolutely uh, uh, no understanding of climate change and certainly no concern for the longer term economic impacts there. So, you know, really, uh, you know, don't know how I feel so much about Joe Biden, except that obviously happy that he's not Trump. So um, he's got that going for him. So I was really happy when I saw this news come out. Uh, they worked with the Sanders campaign to be able to announce this deal. And again, this is very similar to uh, a Green New Deal. It's definitely in that vein. It's interesting they're not using that language, 
but you know really uh, what we are trying to do here is have stimulus that has the dual purpose of sort of stimulating the economy and specifically job growth while as well helping to meet uh, climate targets. So if we can do these things, I mean, if this comes to light, if Joe Biden wins and we get a $2 trillion climate plan, you know, this would be absolutely massive when it comes to green infrastructure and, uh, and, and a continued shift from uh, uh, the fossil fuel economy over to the green economy. Gail, see your comment there. Vote Kanye. I don't know about that. Um, let's see. Uh, we're, I think the whole world is just going to be watching this U.S. election, you know, very closely. And, um, and really, in my mind, the best case scenario is going to be a Biden, uh, you know, uh, 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 sort of sweep or a, a blowout. You know, that to me is really the way where Americans can send a very clear message. The worst case scenario is we get an election that's too close to call. Like, can you imagine if we have something like what happened with Al Gore and uh, George Bush, where it came down to those hanging chads in Florida in a legal battle. I mean, I don't think either one of them is would sort of give it up. And, and that to me is the worst case scenario. So, you know, I think we're all going to be holding our breath for the next few months uh, just to get through this political season in the U.S. And, um, you know, fingers crossed. I'm very hopeful that uh, we will get some type of massive stimulus deal that focuses on climate change. So really that's kind of my market update. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. If there are any questions, by all means, uh, throw them in the chat. Happy to talk sort of about current event and what's going on. Uh, otherwise, really the game plan today is just to do it as a Q&A. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions that uh, uh, viewers have sent in uh, over the last little bit. So I can just kind of go through those one by one. Um, and then obviously I will always take priority uh, for questions that are in the chat, that if I can answer something for you, really happy to do so. Um, so I'm gonna jump into the first question. Let me just kind of get this the right size here. Actually, oh, look at that. I, I scrolled down a little bit there. So, okay, so this is from, uh, oh, okay, a question from Gail. Uh, I was researching USXF, SUL, SUSA, but wonder if so high in giant cap, are there decent mid to low cap US ETFs? I don't have too much. Uh, so I don't have so much Microsoft. Uh, okay, great. And then Tyler, I see your question as well. I'll get to that in a minute. So awesome questions, fantastic. So Gail, yes, all three of the ETFs that you've identified are use a methodology that we call cap weighted. So these are weighted by market cap. So let's do SUSA just because it's the biggest one. So uh, um, we'll be able to get this. It has been around for a while as well. But all of these are going to use a weighting that is called uh, cap weighted uh, so that when we look at the holdings, when we look at the companies that are in here, companies with the heavy, with the biggest, it's called market cap, market capitalization, which is the size of the company, are going to have the highest weighting. So you can see here Apple, Microsoft, you know, that's interesting, Accenture. Uh, uh, here's Google Alphabet. So, you know, these are going to be the largest companies in the world. Um, and the, the big ones are going to be most heavily weighted. Uh, from there, you know, you really you have two options. There are two directions you can go in if you sort of don't want as much Microsoft inside your portfolio. Uh, the first is to look at what we call uh, um, either equal weight ETFs or uh, um, sometimes they are considered multi-factor ETFs that are still going to be broad, but they just don't do the weighting by market cap. One of the best examples for this is CHGX, uh, the Change Finance US Large Cap Fossil Fuel Free ETF. Now it's still a large cap fund, but you'll notice that the weighting is not going to be done by the size of the company. Um, where are they here? Here you go. So when we look at the holdings, I'll download all of them. The way it works is it rebalances. I think it's going to be uh, uh, a quarterly would be my guess. I just want to see if it tells me when it rebalances. We'd have to look at it, but whenever it does rebalance, usually it's quarterly. What they do is they just make all the companies the same size. Now, obviously, if some of them do well, then they're going to rise in uh, uh, weighting. 
sort of throughout the uh, 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 that quarter or whatever. So something like Tesla, which I showed you the chart, Tesla has just been incredible. It would have started equal weight, but then now it is the heaviest. And then when it rebalances, it'll go back to equal weight. Uh, same thing with DocuSign or Twilio. What this means is that I'm curious if Microsoft is in here. They are in here, but they're gonna be at about 1%. So when it comes to Microsoft, you know, they will still be in here, but with a much more common percentage compared to everything else. So this would be an example of what we call an equal weight ETF that you could use. Uh, another example would be a multi-factor ETF. So something like WSRI, which is the Wealth Simple North American Socially Responsible uh, 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 ETF that this one, it's not gonna be the, uh, uh, again, the largest companies at the top, but it's also not equal weighted. Instead, they use something called a multi-factor approach where they look at, there's this thing called the Fama French five-factor model. I could get into that, it's a bit of a rabbit hole, but these are like financial factors. And then what they do is they build a diversified ETF using those factors. So again, something like Microsoft is gonna be in here, but you can see at a much, much smaller percentage. So really, you know, rather than looking at these three, which are all uh, 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 cap weighted, and again, the cap weighting is most common. It's used primarily by iShares and Vanguard and a lot of the sort of, I would say, more popular or more uh, uh, well-known ETF providers. Um, instead, you could look at an ETF that uses a slightly different approach, either equal weighting or this multi-factor approach. Now, if you just really wanted to get away from large cap companies entirely, you're like, Tim, I don't want uh, any ETF in there at all. There are some, I believe there's like a small cap ESG ETF. I think it's from Nuveen, I wanna say. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, actually, there is one from iShares, that's fascinating. And then, uh, hold on, I thought it was Nuveen, here we go. So I was right about this. Um, so it looks like they might, iShares might actually have one. Uh, ESML ETF. So uh, this is gonna use the cap weighted methodology, but instead of a large cap fund, this is a fund that's only gonna have small cap companies in here. You can see it hasn't performed as well during the crash. Again, the large caps have been the winners so far this year, but you can see here, you know, the biggest company in, in here are, you know, Pool, I don't know this company, Etsy, I do know Etsy, an online retailer, so that's pretty cool. So again, you know, this is a way to get, sort of this would be US uh, uh, companies, these would be small cap only, and they are using an ESG methodology. Uh, another option would be this one from Nuveen, N-U-S-C, where again, this is gonna be a small cap uh, 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 ETF that does use uh, ESG. So if we look at the companies, Hold on, characteristics probably. Um, where are the companies? Here we go. Again, pool, you know, it's funny. Uh, Etsy's not in here, you know. So really, you know, these would be the, the different options. You could either do one with a different methodology, still large cap, just different weighting, or this would be a way of like really going after those small cap companies. Um, it was mostly to diversify as USXF has 10% Microsoft. So yeah, Gail, like if you wanted to do USXF, if you were gonna do a second one, rather than doing one that's another one that's cap weighted, I would suggest do another US equity ETF that is either uh, 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 um, equal weighted or that is multi-factor weighted. Hopefully that helps. Uh, Tyler, okay. I have a hard time finding community bonds. Is there a site that you use? So when it comes to community bonds, these are really tricky. Thank you for clarifying that you are in Quebec because really, you know, there, there aren't, there isn't a good database. And maybe this is a chance for me to talk a little bit about what I'm hoping to do with my website, uh, that I'm gonna be updating sustainableeconomist.com. Uh, I'm starting the process today, actually this afternoon. I'm gonna start building a wireframe for the new site where I am hoping to have it more as a research portal and that I would love to have a section on impact investments and in a dream world broken down by geography. Uh, at this moment in time, the databases that exist aren't great. 
Uh, there's one called Open Impact, openimpact.ca. So we can see you know, what's in here. But honestly, I just don't know how up to date it is, right? And so if I wanna do, if I do Canada, and then um, I wanna do availability open, and I wanna do retail investors. And if I search for this, you know, community, 10 Cardin is sold out. They sold out a while ago, that's not available. Access Community Bond Fund, we can't do that one. This is, uh, I'm not sure this one, Aventine Impact. I would need to take a look at them, but that's asset management. That looks to me like it's gonna be stocks. Blick, pal, blick, they don't have an offering right now. A life co-op, I'm not sure. There's a CDF, but I don't think they're, yeah, it's out of, right? This is what I'm saying. So, you know, if I'm honest with you, I do kind of hamstring it. What I can tell you, Tyler, is that the only one for Quebec that I know is uh, available right now um, is going to be Fond Action. Have you looked at Fond Action at all? Um, I'd be curious if you had, but this is something that I've looked at. Um, very, very cool, you know, more assertive for more impact. This is the Google translation. So forgive me, you know, uh, it's gonna be doing it into English for me. Uh, but basically what's really cool about them is that it is RSP eligible um, and you do get an additional tax credit. And these are gonna be uh, loans to local businesses in Quebec and they do have lenses for impact. So in terms of equitable and access to capital, and then also looking at greener, these are things they look at. I don't know if I would specifically call this a green option, but certainly local, certainly impact. And um, I gotta say, it looks pretty cool. Uh, you know, I just wanna see, probably would be in here. I, I don't wanna get too deep into it, but they do provide loans um, you know, biomass energy, which is super cool. Anywho, uh, it looks to me like you could finance your business, but also I think that there would be a section for you to be able to actually make an investment. So I would suggest checking out Fond Action for as an impact investment in Quebec. Cool, okay, great. Uh, questions from the chat, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna start just going through the questions I got by email, but obviously if you have questions, comments, throw them in the chat. Uh, always love to see that engagement. So uh, first question is from Jenny in Vancouver. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research and building up a potential sustainable portfolio for going it alone as a self-directed investor on Quest Trade. Hooray, that's a great idea. Uh, based in Canada, aiming for cheap index style investing through ETFs, uh, but just all be considered sustainable investments. Uh, I've been planning to use ESGV and VSGX as my US and international portions of my portfolio, but I've just become uh, aware of potential pitfalls with these. So number one is tax being held, withheld by the US government, and number two is currency exposure. So, okay, um, so let me speak to this. This does come up a fair bit, and know that you know there, there are impacts with this. It gets a little bit down the rabbit hole, but I think this is a good time to do it, understanding US dollar funds and when, when they make sense and when they don't. Um, there are Canadian-based equivalents, so there absolutely are. I've gone through them a bunch on the show. Uh, there's the iShares uh, uh, review that I did uh, uh, as well. BMO, although they're not fossil fuel, free as well. Uh, um, the Well Simple ETFs would all be pretty cheap. They're about the same as ESGV and VSGX, and they all trade in Canadian dollars. That said, I think it is important to understand, you know, the currency exposure for US dollar ETFs and to understand withholding taxes. So let me go through this as a little exercise. The first thing I want to be clear about is when it comes to currency exposure, the fact that they're traded in US dollars does not really matter. Really what matters when it comes to currency exposure is the currencies of the, the companies that are inside the ETFs. So ESGV, this is the US uh, 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 one, right? So this is US companies, but it's the other one, VSGX, that is the international one. And so this is an international ETF traded in US dollars that when we look at the breakdown, the fact that it's traded in US dollars doesn't really matter. What matters are the currencies of the countries where we're investing. That, that's the, the, in real terms, the currency exposure that we have. 
because it doesn't really matter what happens to the US dollar if let's say the euro gets stronger right all of a sudden these companies are going to be sort of like worth more that when they get uh, converted into US dollars it will be worth more US dollars so the value will go up but really it's due to the strength of the euro as the currency rather than due to the, the, the weakness in the US dollar for us holding US dollar ETFs. So really, this is my way of saying that when it comes to ETFs, it's not so much what the, your currency exposure isn't the dollar, the, the currency that, that the ETF trades in. Instead, it's the currency of the underlying assets within that ETF. That's really your currency exposure. So to me, it doesn't really matter whether it's Canadian dollars or US dollars, it doesn't matter. However, what does matter are taxes. Now, this is a little bit of a rabbit hole. So again, I'm going to try to do my best here to be able to look at it. So there is a white paper, foreign withholding tax white paper that I think does a very good job of uh, explaining it. And this is from PWL Capital. I really love the work that these guys do. Justin Bender and Dan Bartolotti, big shout outs. You know, really, really love the work that they do. So there are a whole bunch of different considerations for this. But when it comes down to it, um, let me just see if I can sum it up here. Uh, where is it? Summing it all up. So it totally depends what uh, 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 account you're holding them inside of that if you're holding it inside an RRSP, it's actually better to do US dollar ETFs, US listed ETFs. The reason for this is because there isn't going to be the uh, 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 any foreign withholding tax paid uh, uh, whatsoever. That basically, when it comes to foreign withholding tax, these are taxes that we would pay to the US government Often the way it works, though, is that there is a, a, a tax that is paid by the foreign companies inside the ETF. And then there's a second tax for the ETF itself. So in the RSP, because the U.S. dollar ETFs are not subject to the foreign withholding tax, this is going to be the most efficient place um, to hold uh, and the most efficient thing to hold inside of an RSP is a US dollar listed ETF such as ESGV or VSGX. So if it's inside an RSP, I would actually prefer you own the US dollar uh, version of that. Now in a taxable account, this would be like a margin account or an unregistered account, Canadian listed ETFs are generally a better choice. That here there's, you know, really what we wanna do is focus on the Canadian listed, that really there's no real benefit to having the US dollar listed ETFs. So that's where, you know, it's a bit of a coin toss as far as I'm concerned. And since it is a little bit of a pain in the ass to currency, to exchange your currency and some record keeping because the, the, the US, uh, um, or sorry, the CRA wants everything in Canadian dollars. So you do need to note the currency on the day that you make trades, right? The Canadian dollar, the Canadian dollar listed ETF is usually gonna be the best option. In a TFSA or an RESP, those are not covered by the tax treaty in the same way that the RSP is. So if it's inside a TFSA or an RESP, we really want to go out of our way to use Canadian listed ETFs. Now, it's not the end of the world. If you do want, there's like a US dollar ETF that you really, really want, right? Then you can buy that in your TFSA, but that's where you are going to get dinged for the uh, a foreign withholding tax. So it's really inside the TFSA or RESP. That's where I wouldn't want you to buy these guys. I mean, if you really like them, you could, but the Canadian dollar versions are likely going to be more efficient there. So hopefully that answers your question. You know, really, if you wanna do the deep dive, read this white paper, it's phenomenal. 
But really, you know, to sum up, in an RSP, US dollar listed ETFs are actually the most efficient thing you can own there. Um, in a TFSA or R RESP, you really you want to go for the Canadian listed options that they are going to be more efficient for you. And in a taxable account, you know, it's a bit of a coin toss, although I probably nudge people towards the Canadian listed ETFs just because it's easier. Hopefully that answers. Uh, I see a couple questions in the chat, so let me address those before going back to my Word doc. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, John Moncton, speaking of community bonds, I'm living in Nova Scotia now. Have you heard of the CDF Farmworks? How much of my portfolio would you put into these sort of things? Thank you, Tim. So, okay, so I love CDFs. CDFs are these community economic development investment funds, and they're phenomenal. I went out to Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, like almost a decade ago to like do a presentation on CDFs and just get more people interested in them. They, these are just incredible. I love this structure, and I really wish that other provinces would follow suit. So this is, it's basically a pool of capital raised for the sale of shares that is invested in new or existing local businesses. So this is all about local businesses, which is phenomenal. Now what you're asking about is a very specific one, which is Farmworks. Uh, oh, you want the white paper in the chat? Yeah, I can totally do that. Thank you for that. Hold on. Uh-oh, where did it go? Here we go. Here you go, go. Perfect. Um, that's a good call. If people ever want me to, you know, throw links in the chat, that's an easy thing for me to do. So thank you for that question. Um, okay, so Farmworks. Farmworks. Farmworks seed it. So, oops. So basically, uh, Farmworks is one of these community economic uh, development investment funds. You can see why we use the acronym CDF. It's a little easier to say. Um, and basically, this is investing in local farms, uh, which is phenomenal. So um, they now I don't know if they have an offering right now, but they have had previous offers. So, for example, this is March 10th, 2019. I noticed they often do it in and around uh, RSP season. So it wouldn't surprise me if really like January, February is when I would be keeping my eye out for this. And so you can see that Farmworks uh, raised almost half a million dollars uh, um, for a total of 2.7 million, which is, and you can see their mission here is to promote, provide strategic, responsible community investment in food production and distribution to increase access to a sustainable local food supply for all Nova Scotians, right? Incredible mission. That's fantastic. And then what I love about it even more is on the financial side, that investments in CDFs may be eligible for a 35% Nova Scotia non-refundable equity tax credit. Um, so, you know, really what we're doing here is uh, we get a, a, a tax credit plus the RSP contribution, right? And then we get extra tax credits um, for 20% and 10% at the five and 10 year investment uh, anniversaries if the CDF meets required conditions. So what this means is that you're gonna get uh, uh, basically like, you know, a tax credit for 35% of your investment right off the bat, plus you get the RSP contribution, which means that this is a really tax efficient investment, that the province has gone out of their way to encourage investors to take their RSP and invest it in local farms, which to me is just incredible. You can see why I would love this model to be available uh, across the country. You know, every province ought to be doing this. So um, in terms of, of, of how much of my portfolio would I put into these things? So, you know, John, it's really hard because each one is gonna have its own risk. So in order for me to properly assess this, I would really need to do my homework on Farmworks. I would want to understand their business plan, their past performance, how long they've been around, and really you know, understand that this is not a liquid investment. This isn't something that we can buy and sell like ETFs. This really is a sort of locked in impact investment. So you know, to start, I would be very, very cautious. You know, we always say don't invest more than you're prepared to lose. Obviously, that's not very helpful. So, you know, I would start probably at 5% or less, you know, until you had a lot of confidence. If you're willing to do the work and you're willing to dig in and do this, you know, the most I suggest people do is 10% for, uh, 
for impact investments, right? Now, in a dream world, that wouldn't all be into this one CDF because if this one fails, that's 10% of your portfolio. So in a dream world, I would like to see it, you know, potentially other CDFs or other community bonds or green bonds, impact investments to sort of add up to that 10%. Um, that said, you know, if you really liked it and you really wanted, and again, the, the tax credit on this is just phenomenal um, to be able to, to make that investment, you know, I would say upwards of 10% of your portfolio, that would be the absolute max. But realistically, I would say start by dipping your toe in the water, you know, until you do feel more comfortable with it. Um, you asked the question with the economy and small businesses doing poorly now, is now a good time for CDFs? Are they safe? And again, it's just gonna depend so much on the CDF um, that, you know, some of them have failed, I think. You know, my understanding, there are a couple that have fo uh, followed and, you know, it's, it's really, this is a long-term investment and you are locked in. So really the worst case scenario is, you know, let's say you invest $10,000, right? You get your 35% tax credit right away. So I think the way, now I don't know, it's a non-equity tax credit. So I think you'd get 3,500 as a tax credit is my understanding. Um, from there, you know, so basically you only paid $6,500 for that $10,000 investment. But the worst case scenario is that you would watch that investment fall over five years, over 10 years, and there's nothing you can do about it. And you know, I saw this happen here in Ontario. We had these things called labor-sponsored funds. Labor-sponsored funds. And I remember it was the same thing. They had this tax credit, you know, and it was this big thing, and so everyone started doing it. But then it did, uh, people started to abuse it, is my recollection. Now, this is like when I was a kid, I remember my dad dealing with these things. And this is from the Fraser Institute, who I don't love, but you know, it's, it's important to kind of study why they did fail. And you know, really it didn't do the job. Um, it, you can see, you know, significant waste of tax dollars. I'm shocked that the Fraser Institute would call something a significant waste of tax dollars. But, you know, really it didn't, it didn't pan out to the point where the whole program was canceled here in Ontario. And you can imagine being an investor and making an investment and watching it slowly but surely deteriorate and not being able to sell. So that's really the worst case scenario. Uh, I feel like Farmworks has been around for a while. This is their eighth offer of shares. So as far as CDFs go, I feel like this is probably one of the most established and one of the best ones. Um, I would, but I would really want you to, uh, uh, to kind of do your homework on it. It looks like there was actually a ninth offer. So yeah, so it looks like every year around RSP season, you know, and they've been raising another half million dollars, which is incredible. So, you know, I would want to do some homework. I would want to do a little research, do your due diligence there. But, you know, absolutely, this is something that I think can actually make your portfolio a little bit stronger. Um, obviously, if, if there was a real economic problem and farms were in serious trouble, that this would be impacted. That said, you know, my guess is that they've got a lot of different loan recipients, that there are a number of programs, and that really that a lot of the, the farmers and the people within this industry are going to do absolutely everything they can to stay in business. Whereas when it comes to some of these bigger companies, it's like as soon as they're not profitable, they're just going to shut down. Whereas I don't really see that in the sector. So. I feel good about it. I'd want to do more homework. I'd want you to feel good about it. Um, I'd want you to dip your toe in the water with a small investment to start. And then, you know, really with portfolios, the most I would ever want you to do is 10% of your portfolio across all several impact investments. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so uh, a question from Eva here. Uh, could have a look at the new Wealthsimple ETFs to assess performance now that there's slightly more data also, what is your preference between the new Wealthsimple ETFs versus the iShares one? Oh, you are asking me some tricky questions right now. Okay, so uh, let's we can look at them for sure. Um, now, it's a little bit tricky. The All Country World Index um, isn't going to be a great fit. So, you know, what I would do is, uh, you know what? What might actually be better is um, uh, 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 equity, what is it, uh, XEQT that this is a 100% stock portfolio. It does have a home bias. Um, yeah, I'm sure you're sorry. No, it's a great question. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, really this is uh, uh, the core equity ETF portfolio. I don't know if they're gonna show me what's inside here. Yeah, they actually do. 
So you can see here that this is uh, a combination. So this is 46% uh, US stock market, uh, uh, EAFE, which is Europe, Australia, and the Far East, 25%. You can see Canadian is at 23%, and emerging markets is at 5%. So this one does have a home bias, so it's not gonna be perfect, but it would be the probably the closest thing in terms of a Canadian dollar global equity ETF. Now, what I want to do is let's look at this. We can really only look at it over the last three months. And now what I can do is add WSRI, which is the North America. So again, this will probably have outperformed a little bit because the US has done quite well. From there, we would need to add to it WSRD, which is going to be the developed markets. I'll make that one pink. And so actually they've both done well. So, I mean, compared to the benchmark, you can see that they started by tracking it fairly closely and then really starting sort of July 15th or, you know, 16th, right around there, that actually they have outperformed by a little bit over the last three months. Let me just do one more comparison. Um, I'll, let me do the XAW. This could just be another, it's a Canadian dollar benchmark, but this is the MSCI uh, uh, minus Canada. So, and actually, okay, so this tells me that the well simple ones so far are kind of off to a good start. Kind of excited about that. Um, happy to see that. Uh, okay, so if you're asking me between well simple versus iShares, honestly, it's a coin toss. Um, and they're both going to do very similar things in my mind. My personal preference, my personal preference is the cap weighted approach that to me, I just, I feel good owning a whole bunch of Microsoft and Apple and you know, those companies that are really, really big. So to me, because that has been the more standard approach, I would probably lean more towards the iShares. Um, I, I guess I'm just like not convinced on the multi-factor approach. Maybe I need to do more homework. I know that there's a lot of academic research that shows that long-term, um, it is more uh, 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 more profitable. That said, you know, for me, it's just one of these things where these multi factors are just so new that I'm still, you know, I want to see them, and this is super encouraging. Being able to look at them and seeing that there actually has been some outperformance here in such a short period is great. But I'm gonna want to see them, you know, for I would say probably about a year before I would really look to 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 sort of switch my opinion here, um, you know, but really I do think that they're both very, very good approaches. But you know, if you're forcing me to pick one with my own money, I would probably do the iShares just because I understand the approach and the methodology a little bit better as well that, you know, when it comes to ESG ratings with MSCI, I sort of trust MSCI's ESG ratings. Um, whereas with Wellsimple, they're not doing ESG, they're using the gender diversity and the, the carbon footprint, which are things I totally believe in. But to me, I just, I, I, would, I would say that I do appreciate the broader ESG. Uh, let me just throw in the iShares ones in here. I'll get rid of that benchmark because we don't really need that. And let's just do xcsr.to. Um, what color should I make these? Why don't I make these sort of in the yellow orange family? So you can see this is Canada. And so this one has actually rebounded quite nicely. Now, I wonder if I can get them as of this date, which is, it looks like June 17th. So I wanna do a custom date and I'm just gonna do as of June 17th. There we go. And so that now they're all sort of starting from the same place, I think. Yeah, they're all starting there. Curious, okay. Um, from there, what I can do is uh, 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 add in XUSR, which is going to be the US one. And so I'll make that one yellow. And then we would add in XDSR, which is the EAFE one. And I can make this one a different color of orange there. So, you know, really it's kind of cool. You can see all the ESG ones are sort of outperforming the benchmark over the last, what, month, month and a week. So, you know, really uh, happy to see that. 
that, you know, in the recovery that ESG stuff does sort of continue to be doing well. I'm starting to see a lot, you know, uh, Gordon Pape wrote an article in the Globe and Mail about ESG funds outperforming, like more and more people are, are catching on to this. So it's sort of nice to see that. Um, but really, you know, you can see why I would sort of view it as a coin toss, you know, that, that, that if we did, depending on the mix uh, that we did, really the well simple ones, I would probably do more of an equal weighting, whereas the iShares one, we'd have more in the yellow one, the US equity. So the well simple ones probably up by a hair, but, you know, really cool to see all the ESG options uh, outperforming. Um, okay, another question here from Tyler. Uh, how does one factor in a mortgage where they're living into an investment portfolio or is it a separate thing? In my mind, it's a separate thing. Uh, really, you know, when it comes to real estate, that's going to be a very, very separate asset class. So the stuff that I'm looking at is very much focused on the investment world and diversification within investments. You know, the only thing is, you know, obviously if you're saving money every month, so if you're earning more than you're spending and you have a little bit left over every month, there's always the question of should I pay down my mortgage faster or should I invest it? And that's really gonna come down to uh, uh, your mortgage rate and the interest rate you're paying on the mortgage. And the question is, do we think we could do better in the stock market or you know, do we wanna just pay down the mortgage faster? So that does impact it a little bit. There's a little bit of math we can do there. Can you know go through my logic on that question if you're curious about it. Um, but really as it comes to like assets, you know, really real estate, that's, that's gonna be a very separate bucket entirely. Um, and that, that I don't really factor into it when it comes to an investment portfolio, um, that, that really uh, I would view them as two separate things. All right, let me take a little sip from my smoothie here and then I'll get back to questions. Awesome, Eva, glad it's helpful. That makes me happy, okay. So a couple other questions uh, from Phil in Ottawa. Uh, Phil asked me, is it a good idea to put a stop limit order on Inquestrate? Example, for a 20% loss of the stock. Um, that could have saved losses and one could have repurchased them cheaper, but maybe my thinking is flawed. So, okay, let's start by explaining to everyone what a stop limit order is, uh, because it is a very, very specific thing. So uh, a stop limit order, really what this is going to do, uh, I like Investopedia. Um, so this is gonna be uh, basically a trade that you could set up in Questrade or any platform where you would set it as a sort of a limit order. And then what we would do is we would set a price that's very, very low. So what, uh, uh, what's being proposed here, what Phil is suggesting here is that we take the current share price we look at what it, the share price would be at a 20% loss. So if it was trading at 100 bucks uh, uh, a share, that we would put in an order to sell if that share price hits $80 per share. So really what this does is this is a way of protecting your losses. You're worried that a company is gonna go bankrupt or something like this, that you're then gonna go, uh, uh, or, or that there's a big drop, that the, you're telling the robot, you're telling the system to automatically sell it for you um, if it drops below a 20% loss, at which point it would do the trade automatically for you. And then Phil is then assuming that he will then be able to buy those shares back at an even lower price. So really this is the type of thing, this is like a more of a trading mechanism. And the only time this makes sense is if you're going to be like following it. And if you're going to get a, like a notice from the robot that you've sold that share, that you're then going to track it because then you have to decide when the heck are you going to buy back in. Now, there are times where this could have been a good idea. So, for example, let me just go back to my all country world index. This is our benchmark. Let me get rid of all these lovely securities. And so let's look at it, you know, uh, uh, over the last year that, you know, had we, let's say right at the top at $81 and 44 cents, right? You said, okay, what I want to do is uh, look at what the price would be if it dropped by 20%. And at $65 per share, I'm going to put in an automatic sell order. So as soon as it got down to here, 
or $65 rather per share, it would have sold for you. Boom. Awesome. You protected your loss. However, now you're in the position of deciding when are you going to buy back. And it's really hard to decide when you're going to buy back. Now, you could have noticed a little rebound here. And even if like you missed this like the first couple days after the Fed, the central bank said they were going to start buying bonds and, you know, the market came back up, even if you bought back in at $63, okay? But again, like you really have to be paying attention to it and, and to decide when you're going to be buying back in. Now, the worst case scenario would be if you did something like this on Tesla. Oops, and let me do a year. Here we go. And you can see here that at one point it was trading at like 900 bucks. Where was it? I had it, let's call it, call it 900. So again, let's say right at the peak, you're like stop order loss. Um, you know, I'm gonna set it at $720 per share that now as it fell and it hit 724 right it would have sold those shares for you from there now you really have to guess when to buy and the worst case scenario is that it sells for you and that you don't buy back and now all of a sudden you protected your downside but you just missed this entire upside now, obviously, if you were paying attention and you saw that it bought, and if we had the time machine or the crystal ball and you could, you know, sell it at the peak and buy it at the bottom, you know, you would be laughing. You would be, you know, in, in good shape there. But my concern is that, that, you know, when you put that stop loss order in, if it bounces back up quickly, you're screwed. You just locked in a loss. So, you know, for buy and hold investors, I would really suggest just buying and holding over time. Um, the time when someone got really screwed, if we want to talk about like worst, worst case scenario when it came to this, there was a time where there was this thing called the flash crash. This was in 2010. Uh, I remember watching this happen. I was watching CNBC and I watched this happen in real time. And basically what happened was there was a huge stock market crash for 36 minutes where you can see the stock market just fell dramatically and then bounce right back up. Now it ended up being this problem with the system. This is why they've implemented these like circuit breakers and these other things. This was like a computer algorithm problem. But what happened is the stock market started to crash just due to a system error. And because people had these stop loss orders in, they kept selling and it kept crashing. And then it literally bounced back up within minutes. Now I think the end result is that they ended up like basically just forgiving all of the trades. They just like wiped them away. Um, but, oh, this is interesting here, 22 criminal counts. I'm gonna have to uh, learn a little bit more about this, but it looks like someone might have manipulated this. Uh, but it did happen. And then uh, my, I'm gonna have to do a little bit of research here, but I think they actually did reverse all the trades for it. But, you know, you can just see why this would be an absolute nightmare scenario where literally, you know, there's a crash for some strange reason. It triggers your stop loss order. You sell those shares. Within minutes, it recovers and it bounces back up. You just locked in a 20% loss and you missed the 20% bounce back. So that's why I wouldn't suggest uh, uh, these uh, uh, stop limit orders. You know, I just, I wouldn't suggest them. I don't think you need them. The only time it makes sense is if you do want to protect against a big loss and you're willing to follow it very, very closely and confident to make a decision about when to jump back in. Hopefully that answers that question. Uh, one from Steve here, he asked me, uh, am I aware of any ETFs that invest in indigenous led businesses or communities? <clears throat> Sadly, no, I haven't seen anything about this. I haven't even seen like that many ESG screens around this. There are a couple small little impact investments that are only available to accredited investors. Uh, so I have seen a couple of things there, but no ETFs. I would be hard pressed to find individual companies that are indigenous led. So just like a list of stocks that are. This is definitely something I'm gonna keep my eye on and, and really I hope to see a little more action here. And if I do see anything, then uh, I'll let you know. 
Uh, from there, uh, uh, more of a comment from John. Uh, he suggests that I look at uh, bicycle stocks. They seem to be flying. So we can take a quick little look here. Uh, so let me just see here, list of bicycle stocks. There's been a huge lineup at the bike stores uh, uh, in my neighborhood. So I think this is a pretty good idea. Uh, there are a few different companies here. Uh, Shimano and Merida, I think, are publicly traded. So let's take a look at Shimano. Uh, let's start by looking at the Japanese quote. Oh yeah, look at this. So this is interesting uh, over the last year, but you can just see, you know, really in May, uh, shares of Shimano have just jumped up quite considerably. This is all in yen, but from like 15,000 yen up to 21,000 yen. So like maybe a 40% gain there. Wow, that's pretty good. Uh, what was the other one? Merida, I think. What is it? Uh, I feel like it's Merida Industry. Yeah, wow, look at this. This is pretty cool. Again, you know, in the crash and just has bounced back up quite dramatically. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, let me just see. I just want to get that list. Here they are. Uh, Excel. I wonder if that is publicly traded. Excel. Yeah, here we go. It looks like this is a Dutch company. So we can look at it on the Netherlands exchange. Uh, so not quite the same. Excel hasn't. Now, you know, that's uh, interesting to me, not as much as the other ones. Uh, I couldn't tell you why. I just don't know enough about this industry. Let's maybe look at one more uh, giant bicycles. Let's try that one see if that's giant bicycles. No, I don't think unless it's like a uh, giant manufacturing, that could be it. But uh, any tandem group, I'm curious, tandem group. Oh, here they are. This trades on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, wow, okay, this is seeing some, some funny trades here. Not too sure what's going on. I assume that's just a problem with the data, but uh, uh, this looks kind of cool. Oh, and I'm seeing here from Drew, video game stocks, ESPO, yeah. I bet the, the e-gaming, uh, uh, definitely esports is a thing. Wow, look at this. Oh my goodness. Wow, that's incredible. So, you know, this is just kind of the new economy. Uh, people are playing a lot of video games. They're riding a lot of bicycles. I uh, love looking at, th at it through this lens. Again, I'm not gonna go out of my way to, you know, put these things inside my portfolio too deliberately. Uh, they would fall under what I would call the doing more good part of your portfolio, like the mad money part of your portfolio. So probably no more than about, you know, 15% across all these different themes. So whether it's green, whether it's bicycles, whether it's esports, things like that. But wow, that's fascinating. Uh, okay, Vincent Young. Hey Tim, if you hold a US listed ETF like SDG in your RSP, you don't have to pay foreign withholding taxes on dividend. That is correct. Is this automatic or is this something you need to deal with at tax time? Um, uh, 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 so th no, this is automatic. So basically it's covered by the tax treaty. You don't need to worry about it. It's inside a tax shelter that's covered by a tax treaty. So really the whole foreign withholding tax thing, you know, that's going to be automatic. The only time it's not is if it's inside a margin account that that's when you can actually claim them. So you would pay the foreign withholding taxes and then you can actually claim those taxes uh, on your tax form. So if it's inside a margin account, pay attention to that. But if it's inside an RSP, no problem at all. Uh, is SDG still my top pick to a company, ETHI? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So ETHI had the methodology change, so that got updated. I did a video on that uh, probably about a month ago. Um, so it's a little bit more diversified. They went from 100 companies into 200 companies. But because it, 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 it uh, tracks the NASDAQ exchange, it's very heavy into tech and it's got almost no exposure to consumer staples. So SDG, you know, definitely still, uh, 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 still the top pick there in terms of an option that sort of dovetails nicely with uh, um, uh, ETHI. Uh, comment here, uh, thanks for the question, re-indigenous led options, something I'm also interested in, agreed. Uh, I would love to see more options available there. Uh, let's see, hopefully the market is listening to me and there will be some options available. A uh, question from D Drew, is SDG considered a doing more good like PBD or PZD? Yeah, Drew, absolutely, that's right. 
um, that SDG, you know, it is thematic that they are uh, uh, screening in companies that are aligned with the sustainable development goals. So this means there's actually going to be a fair bit of overlap in the companies between uh, SDG and the green stuff like PVD or PZD that um, really the SDG is going to have all of those green things. And then in addition to that, it's going to have things like education, health care, uh, 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 food, uh, soaps and sanitation, things like that. So, you know, SDG is really going to be, in my mind, the broadest of the doing more good ones. And then there are some more narrow uh, um, uh, ETFs. So, for example, an education ETF. This just came out literally like the last couple weeks ago. I found out about it just the other day. So it launched on July 10th. So you can see it's so new. And this is very specifically around education. So I'm going to prefer SDG because it is broader. Also, it does have an ESG screen, which I like. But then, you know, there are going to be these even like, you know, subsector ETFs like PZD, like PBD for renewable energy, PZD is clean tech, or this one for education. So SDG definitely is the most sort of well-rounded of those doing more good ETFs. Uh, cool. So we're at one o'clock, so I don't want to go too much longer, uh, but I do think I have uh, one more question here, which is a bit of a rabbit hole, so I don't want to spend too long on it. But uh, if there's nothing else from the chat, then you know, really happy to address this question from Rick. Um, so he listened to some interviews uh, with an analysis that uh, asked, you know, why the markets are so high, and explained that it's because of the unprecedented Fed incursions into the marketplace, buying high yield ETFs, and th these are going to be bond ETFs, uh, is a very big step. So Rick is asking, what are high yield ETFs? And these are going to be, again, bond ETFs. And I'll explain what a high yield bond is. Um, and why is this a big step? Is this just the rich being bailed out again, as in 2008? So uh, uh, short answer is yes, this is just rich people being bailed out. And let me explain why it's a big deal. So, OK, when it comes to junk bond ETFs, so this is a, you know one of those things I always get in trouble when it comes to the tar sands and is it the tar sands versus the oil sands and you can kind of like tell someone's bias based on whether they call it the tar sands or the oil sands it's the same thing here uh people that like them are going to be looking at these uh what are called uh high yield bonds whereas you know people like me that don't like them are going to call them junk bonds that junk bonds and high yield bonds are the same thing uh, the reason for this is because remember there is this a uh, credit rating so let me just show you this is the high yield corporate bond index etf um, when we look at what's inside of it you're going to see that this is going to be a mix of bonds so again you know it should be a mix of short term medium term long term although this one doesn't really have long term so really just kind of between one year and ten year uh, it's going to be across a whole bunch of different sectors but what makes it high yield is the bond rating that if you remember in our standard bond ETFs that we'll have like government bonds that are like triple A rated, double A rated, right? And then anything that is below triple B is considered either a junk bond if you don't like it or a high yield bond if you do like it. So these are going to have worse ratings, double B, single B, triple C, double C, single C, and then a D rating. Some of these are even not rated. What this means is that these are high risk of going bankrupt, that these are companies with poor balance sheets that just don't have good credit ratings. Because they're higher risk, investors expect a higher return. So there's this thing called the uh, uh, weighted average yield to maturity. And right now, the weighted average yield to maturity, like when I look at some of the government bond ETFs, it's like between one and one and a half percent. Like it is so low, right? Whereas this all of a sudden is, you know, almost 5% interest rate. Whoa, not bad. Now, the reason it's a higher interest rate is because you're taking on more risk. So this is why I don't really talk about high yield bonds or, you know, what I'm going to call junk bonds, because personally, it's like there's just too much risk there. If I want risk, I'll buy stocks. I'm buying bonds because I don't want risk, which is why I like the ones that are, are lower risk, but also lower return. Now, 
what this means for the Federal Reserve and their response. So let me just take you back to uh, the All Country World Index and March 17th. So if we remember what was happening was we started to have the crash and then uh, uh, I'm going to put in again, I can do like my XBB, which would be a standard, you know, high uh, uh, sort of, I guess, a low risk, but lower return bond ETF. So you can see here that when the crash started, bonds responded the way we thought they would by going up in value. Again, that sort of inverse correlation, which is what we want. However, as the markets continue to crash right around March 10th, the bond market started to crash as well. And until the 17th, this I guess the 18th, this little tip here, this is where I was really holding my breath and I was so nervous because stocks were dropping, but also bonds were dropping. And that scared the crap out of me. And I'm not the only one that a lot of investors were really nervous. This was like peak panic. And that's why in uh, 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 probably right around the 17th, the US Federal Reserve and the Bank of Canada and the central banks announced these stimulus programs. Now, normally in a normal time, the Federal Reserve or the Bank of Canada is gonna respond by lowering rates. They're gonna lower interest rates, right? That should stabilize the markets, right? Drive bond prices back up. That wasn't enough. And interest rates are so low right now that what's, what they're doing is they embarked in this program called quantitative easing. This is the new way that central banks started propping up the market during the 2008-2009 crash. And so this is, uh, rather than simply lowering interest rates, this is a monetary policy in which a central bank purchases longer term securities, i.e. bonds, from the open market in order to increase the money supply and encourage lending and investment. You can see here that buying the security adds new money to the economy. So this is the Federal Reserve or the Bank of Canada dumping liquidity, putting money into the market so that things don't get frozen, that there is liquidity. It also serves to lower interest rates, right? Which is part of the goal of what they're doing. And this is how traditionally the Bank of Canada would lower interest rates is they would just buy bonds and that would have the impact. However, and you can see here, they actually address it. When short-term interest rates are either at or approaching zero, which is where we are, and which is where we've been since 2008, 2009, the normal open market uh, operations of a central bank, which targets interest rates, are no longer effective. They just don't work. So instead, a central bank can target specified amount of assets to purchase. So they're just gonna start buying assets in the open market. And this is what they started doing in 2008 and 2009. Although the, the assets that the central banks were buying were very low risk assets. They were high rated, things like government bonds, or like the highest rated companies, like very much the, not the, the, the high yield stuff, instead the high rating, the AAA, the AA rated bonds. What's different about this time around is that the Federal Reserve started buying junk bonds. And you know, really what they did is, is they just, you know, it's an experiment. You can see here, you know, that really what they did is, uh, here's this one, uh, where was it? Uh, you know, uh, yeah, here it is. Fed makes initial purchases in its first corporate debt buying program. So I guess they weren't even buying any corporate debt, even the higher rated stuff, that they were only buying government bonds. But because everyone was so worried for the first time, they started buying corporate debt. And so basically the Federal Reserve, the US Federal Reserve started buying junk bond ETFs like this one. So let's put it into our chart to see HYG. So you can see here, you know, the blue one, all country world index, purple one is our normal bonds. Now what we're doing is putting in, oops, what was it? H B Y. Is that right? Oh, hold on. No H B Y. Uh, hold on. 
probably H Y B. Sorry, sorry, sorry. H Y G. My bad. Here it is. And let's make this one red because it's a giant red flag. And you can see here that these high yield bonds fell so much and then they, they start to come back up. That a lot of these companies probably were gonna go bankrupt. Nobody was gonna buy their bonds. And so the Federal Reserve did. And what that did is it stabilized the market and it pushed everything back up. So what, you know, really what happened here is the, the Federal Reserve, um, this incursion into the market, that it's not a laissez-faire market, that there was government intervention, the Federal Reserve, bought high yield bond ETFs. And this was a very big step because for the first time, the government was like basically directing bailing, directly bailing out uh, corporations and investors who bought these high risk bonds. Um, and so, yeah, is this just the rich being bailed out again? Absolutely. Uh, basically, you know, it meant that investors and these companies who took too much risk, they got bailed out. Um, meanwhile, you know, everyone else is getting what, like, you know, 600 bucks a week or something like that. I think there's a, the, the, the government check going out in the U S um, you know, really it's, it's awful. Uh, it's, it's an inefficient market. We don't know what the effects of this are going to be long-term. I don't think anybody does. Um, but really what this means is that this is a good thing in the sense that it was governments intervening and preventing potentially like another great depression. However, you know, what it does mean is that it's basically investors who took more risk uh, are the ones who got bailed out. So it is what it is. Uh, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, it's a bit of a tricky one, but I love it, which is why I'm happy to go there. Uh, uh, Tyler, thank you. Uh, it has been great. Uh, thank you for, for participating and everyone who is on the chat, uh, everyone who's watching the video. Uh, if you've watched this long, you know, please take a moment, like the video, uh, subscribe, ring the bell. You'll get the notifications for when I'm going to go live. Um, I'll probably go, uh, I think I'm, no, for sure I'm going to go live again in two weeks. Um, so that'll be uh, into August. It'll be Thursday at noon is sort of the new time. And I'll make sure I send out um, that, that email. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining me on a, a beautiful Thursday afternoon. Hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.